We're delighted to introduce session 70, Brexit and the British, presented by Red FM, Bajate Raho. We have with us three informed onlookers, Nikesh Shukla, Rachel Johnson, Sir Roy Strong, CH, in conversation with James Crabtree. Let's welcome the panel on stage with a huge round of applause. Good morning. Come on, panelists. Rachel, you can come around here. OK, Roy, Roy, yeah, you, Roy, you come around here. Rachel, you can sit there. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Delightful to see so many of you up here. The sharper-eyed amongst you will have noticed that I am not, in fact, Jeremy Paxman. Um, I am, in a sense, your pound shop version of Jeremy Paxman. Why Jeremy Paxman is not here is not clear to me. I was not told but I was invited to take his place and I'm delighted to do so. So uh, thank you very much for being here. How many of you in the audience are British? Hands up. How many of you voted? Ha keep your hands up. Hands up, all of you. How many of you voted leave? Ah, okay, so that's a sense. Okay, we've got two over here, the gentleman in the hats. Very good. Only two, was that it? Two leave voters out of an audience of some hundreds? Okay, all right, very good. So we've got, we've got, we've got a sense of our audience. Um, what we're gonna do this morning, we have an hour to go through the national humiliation or renaissance of Britain, depending on whether you're one of the gentlemen in the hats or everybody else. Um, I have an all-star panel to discuss this. Uh, on my far right, uh, figuratively, if not uh, politically, Rachel Johnson, columnist, author, broadcaster, uh, member of a famous political family. Uh, on my immediate right, uh, Nikesh Shukla, um, uh, again an author, essayist, editor of a very good uh, recently published collection on the experience of immigration in the United Kingdom and a writer on race and immigration. And to my left, Sir Roy Strong, uh, art historian, curator, former director of the National Gallery, former director of the Victoria and Albert G Gallery, and much else besides. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of them a simple question to begin, which is how did they vote in the referendum and why? And then, in a sense, I want to avoid this conversation being about the minutiae of what's going to happen in the next week and, and take a step back and, and try and ask why Brexit has happened and why it is proving to be so difficult and in a sense what the wider implications for this is for people outside of the UK and in, in particular here in India as well. So let me shut up and hand over to our panelists. So Nikesh, do you want to start us off? How do you vote in the Brexit referendum and why? I voted to remain in the EU. And why did you do that? I like the EU. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, no, I, I like, I, call me crazy, I like things like freedom of movement and, um, hey, I like immigrants as well. Um, and I, I feel like um, as, as a coalition of um, of member states that you know there was there was so much uh, so many amazing things happening no, uh, in like in the cultural sphere in in the science in the science sphere as well and I and I just think it's a shame to walk away from all of that Rachel how did you vote in the referendum and why I also voted a remain and I concur with what my fellow panelists has said um, I lay awake last night sleepless about Brexit, as I, may, maybe many of you do. And then in the end, I took a sleeping pill. So um, as I came on stage, my husband said to me, don't be too strident. So it's quite good that I have had a sleepless night and took a sleeping pill, because otherwise I go, as Hugh Grant puts it, shouty crackers, and I can explode. Um, I voted Remain. I, I am also a, of immigrant blood, Turkish, French, German, Jewish, Lithuanian. Um, I wouldn't be here unless 
Britain had given a home to my grandfather when he was orphaned. Um, I went to the European School in Brussels. I think that, I know it's Republic Day, but I think nationalism is a macho, outdated concept that leads to far-right <laughs> populism. I'm an internationalist, not a nationalist. I'm a globalist. I would happily pay Angela Merkel to run the UK for as long as she cares to do <laughs> as our own cabinet. Chris Grading can't even organize a traffic jam at Dover. Sir Roy, how did you vote in the referendum and why? Well, I'm going to be extremely unpopular because I'm the third person that voted, that voted Brexit gathered here today. Uh, oh, I'm glad somebody said who Sorry, can you, can you hear this at the back? Can, can you, you hear this? Yeah, that's it. You need can, to hold it a little closer. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I voted Brexit and the reason why I'm an historian and I'm, I'm going to be 84 this year, so I've lived through a lot of British history. But also, it goes back to being a historian. In 1973, we joined the EEC, the European Economic Community. I was pro that. I wrote about it from the cultural side. 1975, we had the referendum confirmed. Then in 1993, there was a tr the Treaty of Maastricht, then went towards it being a European state. That was confirmed in 2009 with the Treaty of Lisbon and Britain found itself part of a European state. For centuries, the island has always been independent, a different, strange place. It uh, always, its rock of its foreign policy was that no power in Europe should get so large as to swallow us up. We defeated the Spanish Armada with Queen Elizabeth I in 1588. We defeated the forces of the French and Louis XIV in the 17th century, Napoleon at the end of the 18th century, Hitler and the Kaiser in the 20th. And we have now found ourselves swallowed into a European state. And I'm not very happy about that, but I'm very pro being part of the European economic community. And I think the fact that that's got lost sight of, it threatens actually the, the constitution and the sovereignty of crown in parliament. It, uh, threatens the English legal system, which has always been different. The extraordinary thing about the UK, and perhaps what, what's wrong with it, we never had a great revolution which has swept everything away. Uh, I mean, that is both its glory and maybe in the 20th century its problem. And of course, we always welcome immigrants, goodness me. The only thing about the, the, the cause the rupture on immigration to the UK, there was 1.4 million people were coming to the country every decade. By the end of the, this century, we'd have a population of 80 million, and we simply don't have the resources to sustain it. But, but there we are, that's where we are, and of course that caused friction. But it's not the only thing, there's a lot of other things, as I know James will pick up on. Now you can see, uh, I think, is this working? Can you hear me? No. No? I'm going to have to borrow your three on this. Hello. All right. Roy and I are going to have to You can see why I put him on this side and them on the other side. <laughs> We're going to separate them, um, even if the gentlemen in the hats over there are mingling amongst the audience. Now, so normally as a chairman in this uh, type of situation, you try and encourage your panelists to disagree with one another. I think this isn't going to be that hard this morning. Um, Rachel, do you really want Angela Merkel to run Britain, or are you, are you being flippant? Well, I mean, of course, it's, it's all my attempt at a joke. I mean, Brexit is so unfunny. The only joke I've ever heard about Brexit was apparently one in a Christmas cracker this year that went, an Irishman, a Scotsman, and an Englishman walked into a bar. The Englishman wanted to leave, and then they, so they all had to. Ha, ha, literally, that's as funny as it gets. I think what Sir Roy said, I mean, it, to me, in a way, demonstrated my point that people who voted leave fetishize um, in past imperial power and past military glories and past successes in Europe. And, you know, we just set that ship sailed so long ago. And I wish you, Roy, had mentioned, you know, you said that you talk about British exceptionalism. We had an exceptionally sweet deal with the EU. We weren't in Schengen. We weren't in the EU. We weren't in the Asylum Treaty. And the people who told 
the three people in this audience to vote leave, told them they could have their cake and eat it, but everything they said was pie in the sky. And those chickens are coming home to roost because the problem is not the people who are trying to leave. The problem is not the parliamentarians, the problem is not those who voted leave, the problem is Brexit. We cannot leave in any way that's going to satisfy you or satisfy the 16 million, 0.4 million people who voted remain. It is an unmitigated disaster. And I'd love to hear your take on this. What do you think, do you see any upside at all? Do you want to come back on that? Thank you. Um, well, we don't know what the upside will be. I mean, uh, obviously this is, this is the age of the internationalists and people on my right who go around the world, the, the, the new international uh, as it were, culture and elite. Um, I think it's thrown up in the country. They're, it's the most, it's the biggest crisis to hit Britain since 1642, yeah. when Parliament refused to dissolve itself in the face of the King. That ended in the most violent civil war, which is a terrible thing to happen. What you have now, which is extraordinary, because the British work on the notion you vote for somebody who represents you in Parliament and their job is to carry through what is voted for. Now we can argue around the referendum, this, that and the other, but okay by a small margin, over 50% of the population voted to leave. We are now facing a constitutional crisis. That's just wrong. The Parliament is Parliament not against the King. Parliament is actually against what is the voted will of the people. It is a very dangerous pr precedent. Okay, I could go on and say that the political classes have changed and they are at a very low ebb right across the board and there are no great people anymore who can articulate. We've, had one of, we've got one of the worst prime ministers I can ever remember. Uh, Rachel, what was the specific thing you wanted to disagree with? Well, I just think that we can't say the majority voted to leave because 37% of the electorate voted to leave the EU on an advisory referendum. It was not a legal instruction to Parliament. Theresa May decided to interpret that result as a order, which is why we know how she played her hand incredibly badly, shot the bullet, Article 50, not, not knowing the way forward. We still don't know the way forward. Do we need to go on? It, all right. I, mean, I feel we should play Brexit bingo. You know, every time someone says, will of the people, just get on with it. <laughs> you know, why haven't we left yet? So, Th these, are all the, these are the only lines the leavers have. Nikesh, let, let, me, let me come back to you. So, uh, so Roy mentioned a kind of point of view that you hear in this debate about why this happened. And that there are various accounts you could give that I want to tease out a little bit. But he gave one which is fundamentally to do with multiculturalism and immigration. And it is a view you hear that in particular because of the rapid number of migrants who came from the accession countries, that this was sort of too much too fast and it spooked people. And that's an explanation you hear. And I suppose I, I, I presume you don't agree with that, but I just I wondered what you thought about it. And you also, when we were talking before, you know, had a certain way you described the campaign, and I wondered if you might sort of explain to people how you viewed it from that point of view as well. Yeah, um, <clears throat> where to start, really? Um, I, I, I don't think Britain has properly engaged with um, multiculturalism in a meaningful way. You know, in the, in the late 90s, there was this joke that sort of, it was still banned samosas and saris, but that you know that isn't like that isn't a meaningful engagement with what multiculturalism is. And then you know a lot a lot of what's bandied about. Uh, I'm I'm a, I, I'm a youth worker when I'm not a writer, and a lot of the stuff that is talked about um, in schools is this idea of British values. And and you know people say you know it's all about British values, but when you look at what the British values that are being taught in schools are, it's um, <clears throat> it's a, a respect for um, the rule of law and democracy and a, a mutual uh, respect for um, people's beliefs uh, and faith or lack of them. 
And the, the, the thing is, I don't, you know, those, those things are quite basic and, you know, I think we could all, we could all hold ourselves up to, to that. But I think that, that doesn't say anything quiz essentially, quiz essentially about what it means to be British. And the, the, both campaigns, I think, really, really honed in on immigration being, being out of control. And, um, and you hear, you know, and I, and I think there was a certain aspect of the, cam the campaigns that was like fundamentally incredibly racist. And a, a lot, I hear a lot of Leave voters say, you can't assume that all Leave voters are racist. And I hear that said a lot, but the thing that I never heard once during the campaign or since was any Leave voters condemn the racism that was in those campaigns. They were all very quick to say, how dare you call me a racist? But none of them stood up and said, all this stuff, that breaking point poster when Nigel Farage stood in front of, which had Al Al uh, Albanian refugees, um, you know, purposefully chosen brown-skinned people, and, it's, and it said breaking point. No one stood up who voted leave and said, this is racist and this is not in my name. I wish to leave, but I don't wish to leave if, um, I don't wish this to be the message that I'm se sending forward. And I, and I, just, I just call bullshit on people who say that, um, that they didn't vote for racist reasons because you guys were complicit. You were complicit in racism. Whether you voted for it or not, you never stood up and said anything. So let, me, let, me, let me put my Paxman hat on for a minute. So is there, in your sense, is there any kind of thing you can agree with from, so I'll bring Sir Roy back in in a minute, but this notion that there was a period of very rapid immigration into the United Kingdom in the 10 and 15 years before the Brexit referendum. It was unusually high, not something that you'd seen since immediately after the Second World War. Is that a reasonable explanation for putting aside the campaign and the, the Turkey stuff and the Farage poster? Are those who claim that immigration was sort of too fast and should have been managed better, do you see any kind of merit in that at all? Or? Well, I, it's, it's hard to say because, you, you know, you hear, no, you hear different sets of numbers being used by people depending on how they voted. And the thing that, the thing that I think was, um, uh, I think that th the real thing that we, that we should hone in on was a period, like a long period of Tory austerity um, created a disenfranchised um, population who felt so disconnected from, uh, from uh, what was going on politically. And, um, and then you kind of have this sort of very clever messaging about taking back control. And that idea of taking back control was, I, th I think, sort of psychologically for a lot of people about taking back control of what they felt was going wrong in their society. However, uh, as I said, immigration was the thing that was kind of pushed in front of them as the problem instead of like a, a long period of austerity and a recession that was caused by something that was amongst the elite classes. So, I mean, Roy, in a sense, what I'm trying to tease out here, because it has much wider implications than Brexit. It's true in America, it's true elsewhere. The, the Western societies that are struggling with some form of populism, is the problem economic or is it to do with multiculturalism? Well, multiculturalism, I think, was a, a, a disastrous policy. It was a disastrous policy by Blair because it, it asked people to think that they were each different. The genius of the Victorian period was that it set out, and there was immigration of the Jews then. Before that, we had the Huguenots from France, the French Protestants, and it was always setting out to create something which will embrace the whole of society. Our beloved queen the other day, who mustn't have a political view, was opening a, a show by the Women's Institute, women who bake cakes and are in the center for every England, and she couldn't say anything, but she said, we should all look for the common ground, and, and we should look for what we share, and, and, and move from that. The other thing, which I think is incredibly important, time is the great healer. Do you remember when the Pro French Protestants came in the eighth, uh, beginning of the, eighth, at the end of the 70th, beginning of the 18th century? It took about half a century to settle down and they became distinguished members of British society. The same thing happened with the Jews. By the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, 
entirely part of our society. And now already you're seeing, we've had immigration coming, uh, people of color from Jamaica and the rest of it, from our long gone empire, coming into the country uh, in the post-war period. I mean, I just cite a thing I went to recently. The Royal Shakespeare Company did a production of Marlowe's Tamburlaine. I went to see it, it was all cast, I think entirely with people of color. They spoke Marlowe's English in a way I could have wept. It was so beautiful. They had, as it were, come in. And also, all of that is changing now. All of it is changing very rapidly. If you see any advertisement, it, 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 certainly in London, it entirely accepts the fact it's a multicultural city. It's going to take time to, for that to spread through the country. It's going to take time. Time, remember, is the great healer. And I think Britain has always been incredibly generous, incredibly generous to political exiles and all sorts of other people. And I think it is all we got, all that happened at the beginning of the 20th century, it all came too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. Time, by the end of this century, Britain will be a multicultural society in the best sense. Go on, give them a round of applause. I think we were generous with our round of applause at Jaipur. So, Rachel, um, let me, I mean, where, where do you come in on this question of the, the competing explanations for why this happened? We, we heard two. So Sir Roy has said at least part of this is to do with very rapid immigration. We've had the other perspective that actually this was a function of austerity, dissatisfaction, and then sort of the populace was slightly hoodwinked by Dominic Cummings and people like that. I mean, what, what's your sense? Well, I mean, there were hundreds of reasons. I mean, everybody's made their points. Rikesh saying that there was racism. There, Rikesh, Nikesh. Nikesh, sorry, apologies. Nikesh. I mean, not all people who voted leave were racist, but all racists voted leave. I mean, that's a, a, a syllogism that we, I think we can agree. Roy saying, as a historian, that time was the great healer reminds me that the, the people who persuaded the country to vote Brexit are all insulated from the impacts of Brexit, from Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's got his funds in Ireland to, you know, Nigel Lawson, who's got residency in France, to, you know, I, we can go through all the Brexiteers are insulated, but the reason the country voted leave was, were, were reasons made in Britain, not in Europe. They were, you know, the lack of skills, the north-south divide, the failure to train, wage gap, you know, rural poverty, the fact that you don't, can't even get broadband in the country. As soon as you left the M25 during the referendum campaign, you felt it. You felt that this was a London versus the rest of the country issue much more than it was a UK versus EU issue. And lastly, it was a brilliant marketing exercise. Brexit and take back control, as James says, were fantastic slogans. They were propulsive, they were dynamic. The Remain camp had inert messaging and all to do with economic arguments that didn't, that left the voter completely unmoved. They voted with their hearts, not with their wallets, which is why we, we are where we are. Remain just sounds slack. And I think that's, that's my take. N Nikesh, uh, a, a few years ago, those of you who are from the United Kingdom might remember that there were a series of riots in London, uh, a little bit, I mean, similar, not in cause, but in effect to what's happening in France at the moment, disaffected young people. At that time, I lived in Hackney, and there were you know, riots at the end of our street. Um, so you wrote an essay about that, and in a sense that was a, to some degree a post-austerity phenomenon. Subsequent to that, because of Brexit, we've spent quite a lot of time not worrying about the underclass in the cities, but the white underclass outside of the cities, the Brexit voters who have been left behind. And I wondered if you, could reflect a little bit on, on that. You see something similar in, in Trump's America where a lot of energy is now expended on trying to understand the white working class left behind in manufacturing industries. And in a sense, that must draw oxygen away from trying to understand the circumstances in which you know, immigrants who are not white find themselves in the UK who have been, you know, who you have written about and who your essay collection is about. And 
So could you reflect on that a little bit? I only really want to. I, I mean, it's. I, I, it's. I don't. I don't want to talk about the about the working class unless we're talking about it in an intersectional way. Because I think talking about the white working class um, ignores the concerns of the the working class people of colour, um, and I think their concerns are just as important. And um, and, and often they're the ones who are ignored. You know, I, while, we've, while we've had the chaos of incompetent people trying to sort out Brexit, um, one of like, the biggest tragedies that has happened to our nation happened, which was the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. And those pe you know, loads of those people still haven't been rehoused permanently. And they're forgotten about because they're working class people of color predominantly and I and I just think that that is disgusting and so I, I don't I think that it's really important to not forget those concerns but I, I just want to I, I just want to sort of segue into to telling you a little telling you a little story about what you all voted for if you voted leave I was at a, I was at a train station um, I was at Didcock Parkway about a month ago and I was doing probably the most British of things. I was reviewing a play for Saturday Review on Radio 4. And I was, um, I went, went down the stairs, I was hungry. I went, I bought a chocolate bar. I was walking back up the stairs to the platform and a guy approached me and he said, where'd you get your money from? And I, I, I didn't really know what he meant. I thought he was asking me where I got my chocolate from. So I said, oh, there's a shop down there. And he said, yeah, but where'd you get your money from? And I said, Oh, uh, they accept contactless. I didn't really know what he was what he was trying to say. And um, he said, "No, no. What do you do for a living?" I said, "Oh, I'm a writer." And he said, "You you get paid to write. I, I, I haven't got any money, and you've got money. That's really unfair." I was like, "Okay, I, d I don't really know what what you're trying to say." He said, "Oh, you speak really good English." And and this whole thing is sort of happening quite calmly. And I was like, "Okay, well, I was born here." He said, "That doesn't make you fucking English, does it?" England for the English. And I was like, I don't understand what, what's going on here. He said, I could take your passport away just like that if I wanted to. And he walked away from me. And it was such a sort of normalized occurrence. And that is just one of many things that are happening to people on the street. And when, when, I, when I spoke about it online, people were turning it into a, a free speech issue. They were like, well, it's his free speech to come up to you and racially abuse you. And I was like, I think you've misunderstood what free speech is. But this is what is happening. This is what's happening on the ground. So we can talk about... Um, you know, we can talk about the, the sort of the concerns of the white working class in an abstract way, which would be hard given that none of us are from the white working class. We can talk about the concerns of all working class people, which would again be hard because we're not, um, we're not people from, none of us I don't think are, are working class in any way. Um, but I think it is really important to know what's happening on the ground. And that is what's happening on the ground. That's what you voted for. Yeah. People racially abusing me in the street. So, Roy, what you vote you, for. Let, so let me, he doesn't have the mic, so I'm going to, let me, let me ask you this way. So you made the point, which I think is true, that, that for the British people in this audience, there is a sort of national sense that Britain is a tolerant country. And the story that you told, right, hang on, going back to accepting the Huguenots, Jewish refugees in the Second World War, a, a sort of tradition that goes back to Hobbes and Locke of individual rights, and yet it seems to many people that, that Britain is becoming a less tolerant country and maybe that that image that we have of ourselves was not accurate in the first place, which I think is what Nikesh is saying. So what's your sense of that? Well, that, James, is completely untrue. It's a long and really great tradition, more than in any other European country. And let's face it, uh, uh, I mean, really, it, it's awful what one was hearing from Nikesh. Of course, one deplores it. It's simply dreadful. I wanted to make two other points. Do remember, uh, the change in the UK is hugely rapid. London has become, as it were, a city-state that no longer bears any relationship to the rest of the country. The rest of the country is going to take decades to catch up. It is a multicultural uh, society. It's a glorious one, and I welcome that. But it's going to take time. And the, uh, I mean, what the biggest, the, biti the biggest London demonstration was something, something called the Countryside March. It was the biggest demonstration of people from the countryside invading London since the Chartists in the 1840s. 
But it was written up, oh, it was, they were demonstrating in aid of hunting. It wasn't at all. It was a cry from the countryside that it was ground down by people who lived in the Westminster bubble. That is all the, the talk, talk, talk people, including some, a lot of the people who chatting away at this um, particular Jeff Festival. I think also the referendum vote represents something else. It's the disillusionment with our politicians, and I think we may well go into a period. You're seeing the Conservative Party break up. You're seeing the Labour Party break up. What happens every so often in British history, in the 18th century it happened, in the 19th, and in the 1920s and 30s, there is a dissolution of the parties and a realignment. And as it were, the Brexit vote, the referendum vote, has produced this turbulence where I think you will see a completely new political thing uh, being triggered off in a way which I think is deeply regrettable. I think it was such a mistake to call that referendum. We would have had evolution and not revolution, and we would have some degree of calm to develop instead of this terrible confrontation, which is so untypical of everything that really I hope that we represent, certainly that I represent, it's, it's utterly dreadful. It's divided families, it's divided all sorts of things. We must, must get past this. And maybe this reconfiguration, also remember, politicians in the past used to represent their communities. Okay, some still do, but there's a big machine now. Oh, you know, you come down from Oxford and Cambridge, you read politics and economics. Okay, you attach yourself to Prime Minister, to an MP, and next time you're put down in the countryside into a safe suit. See, I, I come from, I live in the countryside. I mean, the present MP, hardly ever seen. I mean, the old link between town and country, so there's, a res there's a polarization there that will need to be sorted out. You don't often hear about the English countryside, but if you fly over England, it still is mostly green. Now, I want to leave some time for questions, so, but let me ask my panelists one more reflection. So many of you, or some of you, might have read an op-ed that Pankaj Mishra wrote in the New York Times last weekend, um, which was, as is often, the case with him, a, a sort of feisty polemic against the incompetence of the British ruling elite. Um, and he went back to, to the Irish independence and Indian independence and basically drew a line and said, another sense that the British have of themselves, which is that their elite is competent um, and skilled, has always been untrue. And that if you look at the mess the British made of the, the independence of Ireland or the partition, uh, of India, it ought not be a great surprise that we are making a great mess of the partition of our own country from the European Union. And so we've already touched on this, but I, I wondered if I could ask the panel to reflect on this. I mean, Rachel, you talked about the, the elite, one of whom is a member of your family who have been part of this, but say a little bit more as to, you know, was it always a myth that the British kind of governing elite were good at this, or, or is it just Jacob Rees-Mogg and Theresa May and David Davis, we just got unlucky with a particular bunch of incompetence. Well, I think Sir Roy's right to, I mean, the referendum was a calamitous error of judgment on the part of one of my colleagues at Oxford, um, one of the many Bullingdon boys who have broken the country thanks to triggering Brexit via the means of a referendum. Um, they aren't, they're not brilliant politicians. I mean, my generation of Oxonians, that many of whom read PPE, some of them read classics, some of them are related to me. One of my brothers is trying to uh, trigger a hard Brexit, the other one's trying to stop a hard Brexit. I mean, try being me. Um, <laughs> try having family Christmas round at mine. Um, history will judge my generation of politicians very harshly. I agree with Nikesh completely that racism has entered the body politic and it's going to be very hard to eradicate it. It strikes me that all the things that the vote to leave are a reaction to, none of them are caused by the EU. The fact that you were approached at Didcot Parkway is a, the fa a sign that the country dislikes non-EU immigration and yet the vote to leave is only going to control EU immigration. So the whole thing was a complete exercise in futility and economic self-harm. Um, as probably 
much of our imperial past was. So, I mean, I leave it to Roy to, to reflect further on that. Nikesh, do you have a, a sort of view on the... the, the, is the Pankaj Mishra called it the chumocracy. This has also been a phrase that I saw in The Economist as well, this sort of sense that the British elite, as opposed to being worldly and liberal and talented, is in fact insular and incompetent. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Come on, uh, say a bit no, more. No, no, no. Um, what, one of the things that I reflected on while reading that excellent piece, and if you haven't read it, I really recommend you read it. One of the things I reflected on was that, uh, and I guess this comes up a lot in my work in the UK around uh, increasing diversity in publishing, but I think, um, I think there is this myth that uh, there is a meritocracy in in the UK, and it's, it's a myth that my dad bought into as an immigrant in the 60s, and it's a myth that led him to vote conservative for much of his life. Um, and, and I think that there is this feeling that if you work hard, then you will have all of the opportunities available to you, and it's, it's just not true. We do not exist in a merit meritocratic society, and I think our... Um, there, uh, the meritocracy is a myth, and you just have to look at the bunch of incompetents who had the best education um, and therefore should be able to do this seemingly simple thing of um, negotiating a good deal. Um, say, why do you say that simple? I was, Are I'm, you one of the just get on with it tribe? Uh, I, I, uh, you may not have seen my sarcastic smirk. <laughs> simple. <laughs> Um, it's not simple. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and they, they just can't do it. But, and, 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 I, and I wonder if there is an alternate universe where, you know, a lot of people who voted to remain got sort of decided that, well, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, and I trust our government is good enough to do it. Um, but we're not in that alternate reality. I think we're in the alternate reality that it, for fans of the sitcom community uh, might recognize this as the darkest timeline. I've heard it said... No that fans of community, because uh, you would have laughed hysterically. Yeah, that, that, one, that one dropped, so... I've heard it said that there are only two types of countries in Europe. There are small countries and those that have not yet realized that they are small countries. Um, Roy, you, you wanted to disagree with Nikesh on the specific issue of Britain as a meritocracy, I think. I am a meritocrat. My father was left with five pounds a week in 1939 to provide for a family of five. I am a product of the Education Act, I think, of 1944. My mother went out to work. She had three boys, and her father said, do what you can to educate them. I went on a scholarship up to the university. From there, I continued on to a job in the National Portrait Gallery. I became its director when I was 31. I worked and worked and worked. I refused. I am entirely meritocratic and self-made, and I'm damn proud of it. And, and also, if you look at, around in British society, I mean, who? Let's take somebody like Peter Hall, the great, greatest director, created our uh, uh, Royal Shakespeare Company on a wor worldwide estimation, son of a station master. I mean, you, you, you can go down the list mostly now. I, can, I could go on about that. People, people in the arts often come from very humble backgrounds, but the, the doors are ruddy well open, I can tell you. But where they don't go is into politics, right? And that's why you see the mess in the, uh, what we've got now. I remember years ago, Sir Isaiah Berlin, a really great philosopher, she looked at me in, and he looked at me and he said, no great men anymore. God is right. Nikesh. I th it's good that you are singularly proof that a meritocracy exists. Thank you. I, like, I, I, j because it's worked out well for you, you know, I don't think that's a fair... Well okay. It also worked out not so well for a lot of people. All right. I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable point to say that simply because you, uh, you made it, Roy, doesn't mean that everyone made it. Well, if you move from an aristocratic society where you stay in your place, but there are ways up, 
um, that's, that's how it's going to be. If you move to meritocratic society, it is inevitable that the bright and industrious will rise and those that aren't so bright and industrious will stay where they are or go down. It's a terrible truth. There is no perfect form of society. There will always be winners and losers because not everybody can win. It's a sad and bitter truth. And how uh, society, those that do well provide for those that have not done so well is a central as it were, tenet whereby we try and run our society in a generous and gracious way. Let me ask one final question before I open it up, which I want Rachel to answer, which is so the, the chumocrats as an image are most, so this is Jacob Rees, Mark Davis, Davis, David Cameron, Boris, um, they're all men, but the central figure in this drama is Theresa May, who in a sense almost gets forgotten for her combination of kind of bloody-minded determination, intransigence, complete inability to communicate. I mean, she herself, sitting in the middle of this, still trying doggedly to get her deal through. Maybe she'll make it, maybe she won't. What, what's your sense of her as the, the captain of, of this ship and, and what she represents? I mean, I find Theresa May a very problematic figure because her only superpower seems to be stubborn resilience and unyielding resistance to logic. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a bit of a crap superpower, isn't it? But anyway. I, I mean, I think it's, she's a, been a disastrous negotiator and um, her, she's now offering the country, well, we, we don't really know what's happened. Does anyone know what's happened today? I mean, her deal or no deal, is the choice on the table, which means that we are all losers, as far as I can see. But maybe, as Sir Roy says, in 50 years' time, we will see our membership of the EU as a 45-year blip in our island history. And it will almost be forgotten as we eat our roast rats in our shelters uh, and <laughs> hope that drinking water is arriving soon. Very good. Well, on that optimistic note, let's open it out to the audience. Um, I would be enormously grateful if your questions were about one or two sentences in length and had a question mark at the end of them. I see... Uh How do you see this unfolding? And let's go to uh, March of 2020. Rachel Johnson, Nikesh, how do you, what is your speculation about where you'll be Very good. in March 2020? Okay, good question. And Ram, can you just hand the microphone to the gentleman to your left and we'll do three. So, so. Uh, I have two questions. How did the Queen vote? And the second thing is, is it time to draft a new constitution for your country? Okay, so let's go down. So Nikesh, there was a particular question to you about sort of civility and then we want to know, in a sense, do you think we're really going to leave or not, I suppose? So do you want to start? Well, firstly, sorry you took it so personally, but I take racism very personally, and I, see, I don't see racism as a thing that's up for debate. I don't think that we could, civility counts when we're talking about racism. And instead of, instead of taking what I said personally, go and fight the racists. Prove me wrong. And do you think we're leaving or not? I think we are entering what would prob will probably be a period of purgatory where um, I, I, am, I, I, can, I imagine it's the, they're going to extend Article 50, the deadline for Article 50. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, in 10 minutes' time, I'll probably think something else is happening. I, I've, I've heard it said that one of the likely options is, in a sense, half in, half out, where we sort of leave and sort of don't, and we call it indefinite leave to remain. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, what's happening? March 2020, where are we going to be? Well, I mean, I don't have my crystal ball. Um, we are supposed to be leaving in only a, f in only a few weeks' time. I mean, oh, unless... On, get off the, are we going no, to no, leave no. or not? It is law that unless we stop Article 50, we will leave with either a deal or with no deal on March 29th, 2019. I mean, that's, that's the law. 
But I mean, my, my alternative suggestion is that all Theresa May need do, I actually have two suggestions. All Theresa May need do is send every single person who voted leave, the 17.8 million or whatever it was, a blue passport and tell them it has happened. And then no, not a word is said about it ever again. Or we have a referendum in the Johnson family, which is 90% remain to one leave. And then we win and then we settle the matter forever again like that. Those are my two best hopes. Uh, Roy, do you want to uh, come back on any of that? Well, I would long for the negotiations to continue and not end so abruptly on March the 29th. Remember, remember that Mrs May is a clergyman's daughter. It explains a lot about her. She goes on and on and on. She is not the willow, which is unfortunate. She is a rather bad example of the English oak. <laughs> Right, I'm going to try and be, um, uh, uh, take a broad spectrum of views. Um, so, Venki, do you want to introduce yourself and ask your yeah, question, and uh, then we'll go over here. I'm, I'm Venki Ramakrishnan, and having lived in three countries uh, here in the U.S. Speak, and, speak up a little bit. Venki Ramakrishnan. I'm, I'm Venki Ramakrishnan, and I've lived in both India, the U.S., and Britain. And I have to say, by mo most social indicators, Britain is not any worse uh, than most European countries and slightly better than the US in terms of social mobility. So we're talking about meritocracy here. And uh, so the data don't support it. It is true uh, that it's always hard if you're underprivileged to come up, but, it, but in Britain it's not any worse. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you want to address racism, uh, let's talk, why don't you try reading the matrimonial ads in India, okay? Uh, I'm a South Indian, and uh, you, can, you can look at all the ads for fair-skinned brides and fair-skinned men, you know, who are required. That's a requirement of the qualification. The third thing about, about the EU is Britain has always been ambivalent. And I, it struck me when I arrived in Britain that when I go to Frankfurt or Paris, the passport signs say EU and others. When you arrive at Heathrow, it says, UK and EU and others, as if UK were somehow distinct from the EU. And this is long before the referendum. Thank you. And I think we have a few questions over here. Yeah, Miss? Um, Stand uh, up. Go on. Let's uh, let us see you. Um, like Jeremy Corbyn, I think before all this began, I was about 7.5%. Following the murder of Joe Cox, it became absolutely clear what this referendum was really about to me. I campaigned for Remain in the South Wales Valleys where people were really, really ignored by this government. Um, and there is absolutely no immigration whatsoever, really. We have a couple of people and we know them by name. Um, however, what was absolutely clear was that the press, and particularly the Sun newspaper, which was being handed out for free in Merthyr and Ebervale, was radicalising people who were actually just pissed off and wanted to tell Westminster that they were pissed off. I don't think it matters whether people meant to be racist or not, because when it comes to institutional racism, I think it is the impact to the count and not the intention. And we have to, everybody I think has to take responsibility for the impact of their vote, even if that isn't what they intended. Very good, and I think there was a question here. So can you just hand that, there's a lady here in a red scarf. Come back, come back, come back, come back. This lady here in the red scarf. There we go. What, and question please. Hi, um, I'm Shreya Dora. I actually work with The Economist. Um, I actually have a question. I think it's increasingly probable that a second referendum might be triggered if, let's say, the deal um, is not passed, because something would have to give. Um, but I wonder, like, do you think there needs to be more transparency, transparency around the second referendum as to what a Brexit deal would actually mean um, economically and politically for the country? Very good. OK, so Nikesh, I think Venki's question was directed to you, sort of. Britain's meritocracy better than you might have portrayed it, um, or do you want to come back on those issues? I haven't seen the data that you're talking about, so I can't really comment, um, I, but I'd love to see it, so I'll grab you afterwards and point me in that direction. And I agree that, yeah, colorism is a huge problem. Um, uh, it's something that I see in South Asian communities in the UK as well. Rachel, the second referendum, uh, I mean, in a, in a sense, do you think we might have one and there's a, do you buy this idea that it's all going to be terribly divisive and we shouldn't have it for that reason? 
Well, I think an, an, a referenda are divisive, which is why they are, and they're also played to the lowest common denominator, which is why they're banned. They were banned in 1945 in, in Germany. Um, I campaigned for a second referendum. I launched Women for a People's Vote on the 3rd of September. And it now I think the chances of a second referendum are receding. The Labour Party voted in conference this last year that if nothing else eventuated, no general election, the Labour Party would support a second referendum. Corbyn doesn't back a second referendum. People's Vote have now basically withdrawn the push for one imminently. I think that I don't see it happening before March the 29th, 2019 anyway. If there is a delay on, on the invocation, on actually our leaving, then I think it's back on the table. But I, I still don't know, I think it's slim chance. 20, I give it 20%, but it will be divisive. But the only positive thing is, I think the people of Britain will have much clearer idea what they will be getting. I don't think that will necessarily cut through because the messaging again of the Leave campaign is going to be, tell them again. You know, it's going to be a two fingers up to the elite, to the bubble, to London. That still cuts through. Roy? Well, just very quickly, I, I agree with Rachel. It will be in, in, intensely divisive. It will only make things worse. Uh, also, nobody knows, as far as I can read all the stuff that comes back from London, how to actually make a voting form, the options that would be on it, because the ways are so various. So actually, no, and I hope we have more prolonged, because we must reconcile everything, bring everything together on a pathway which will bring the British people together in a proper and sensible way, and we, whereby we maintain our friendship with Europe, but we don't become part of it. Okay, a couple of minutes ago, about 30 questions we're not gonna have time for. So, sir, I saw you've been waving your hand frantically. There we go, very quick, and then the lady next to you, and then we're gonna have to stop, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's true that uh, there's a huge wave of uh, populism running over Europe. I'm French, and uh, in France we do have millions of immigrants and also a very powerful far-right party trying to promote a Frexit, xenophobe and racist. But uh, you see, the, uh, I wonder what would have been the result if we had this uh, kind of strange referendum. But thank God uh, our presidents and our parliament never proposed it. And you see, in London... Now, now I need a question now. Yeah, well, uh, no, your question. In London, there is, uh, uh, the mayor is uh, Pakistani born. I hope in Paris we'll have soon an African-born mayor, that's all. Very good, okay, one, there was a lady here right next to you in the yellow, nice yellow, okay. Following on from what the last gentleman said, I have a question I would like to ask the panel whether they have any thoughts on what effects Brexit may or may not have on Europe as a united concept. That's a great point, actually, it's a, a, a fault of my chairing. I was going to ask that, but... Um, so what future for Europe, with or without um, Britain, as a, as a kind of final thought? Let me go down the panel for, for a last thought. Roy? Well, I think we, that it's a very, very good question to be asked. Um, uh, I, I, it, it's apparent that, that Europe is very sad that we're going. And I think one of the reasons we're going is that after we join the EEC, the European Union, the, the EEC, then European Un Union went east and east and east, embracing all the countries that used to be part of the vast domination of Russia, with the result that the axis, we were on the fringes, right? We were pushed onto the fringes, and the main axis, need I say, was our old friend Angela Merkel, and there was Germany back again. Nikesh, a final thought on, on the future of Europe? Are they better off without us? Or? Uh, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I believe we're entering what football pundits refer to as the corridor of uncertainty. <laughs> okay, Rachel, you're a Europhile. You write for a European newspaper. You, what, what, what sense, what future for the European Union if the well, Brits finally skulk off? The EU's been stronger since Brexit. I mean, there was fear of, of contagion and that didn't happen. And I hope that they are big enough to have us back. 
Very good. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Give a round of applause to all of my panelists. Thank you very much for being civil to one another. Uh, and thank you for coming so early in the morning.